Morning worship service of Trinity on the Hill United Methodist Church. We welcome you as we worship the Lord together. Miles and miles around, they'd bring their wagons and circle around the encampment, uh, spend the whole week together as they brought themselves to be self examined before the preaching and the singing of the church. For some of them, this would be the first church they would have had for several months. Uh, so the occasion was great. We're glad that you're here to share in camp meeting in the city, especially as it talks about self-examination, which will be our theme today. We're glad you're here. We want to know that you're here because we have so many worship services that we try to tr keep track of each other. So we invite you to sign in on the welcome pads. They're blue folders located in the corner of each pews. Whether you're members or visitors alike, we want you to let us know that you're here. If you have questions you might want to ask, you have prayer concerns, of course, use the uh, blanks there to make sure that we uh, find out about those because we want to lift you up in prayer through our prayer ministry. As we come now together, Greg's going to lead us in our very spirited singing of our camp meeting songs. I hope you're ready to uh, celebrate and worship Christ in spirit and in grace. One of the wonderful ways we do that is through song, and I hope you pay attention to the words. We will do it peppy, of course, but it's, don't want that to get in the way of understanding what you're singing about. Let's stand together, dwelling in Beulah Land. to you on that second verse. Here we go, choir. To join us in the praise God on that second time, on that first line through the uh, through the chorus as we go through the last verse together. Here we go. View. We hear the words of God. great words for us, love, mercy, and grace as Christians, ones we need to cling to, sing about every day, and this is a great song to start our day every day if we have that possibility, love, mercy, and grace.
on the course, camp meeting style, by yourself. It was love that took my place on the cross of Calvary. It was grace. Come on, let's hear it. That paid my ransom full and free over sin. What else? Oh, yes. I have the victory. Now watch. Through grace, marvelous grace, that lives in me. All right, sit down and take a breath. <laughs> this is where we move into our prayer time. Always very, very important uh, as we consider the opportunity to Open up this altar as a place of prayer. It's not the only place of prayer. Oftentimes during the week, maybe some of you can take advantage of this too. It's great to come into this place when you're alone and, and to be able to be at this altar, just you and the presence of God and not worried about anything else of the world, but just want to come and listen. It's a great, great place to do that. And this particular song, Have Thine Own Way, is one that as a, a new person in Christ in my teenage years, we used a lot within my church to actually come to the altar, opportunity to come and pray and rededicate our lives and answer those calls all along the journey. So allow it to be that for you today as we go to this time of prayer. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the many blessings you give us each and every day and for this privilege that we have to come and to worship your heavenly name, dear God. We thank you for the freedom we have to come to this place, to pray together, to worship and to sing songs that lift us up and encourage us in our walk with you and then to hear your word given to us, Lord, and in a way, Lord, that will soak into our, our being and as we grow more in our walk with you, that we'll carry that witness and that light out into a world that is needing to hear the gospel message, Lord. Give us that strength, that courage to be witnesses for you through our actions, the way that we live our lives, through the, the witness, the verbal witness, Lord, and telling others about that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and what that can mean and what it brings to our lives it gives us hope it gives us that assurance that abundant life now and that hope of eternal life with you one day and dear god we thank you for your love that sacrificial love that you have for us and may that be a model in our lives as we love others as we reach out to express that love in a way that is not built upon conditions but loves because we are loved and that you love us so much. And may that flow through us in a way that opens that door to those that are hurting, that are seeking to find that hope and find that meaning in life, dear God, and that purpose that they're striving for. We lift those this day who, Lord, are in harm's way um, in the name of freedom, when they're living, fighting in that uh, area, Heavenly Father, but also locally here, those who put their, their lives on the line, Lord, in the name of freedom, Lord, and, and our protection heavenly father we lift them to you pray for their families pray that you will just bless them and give them strength 
and pray for those that have lost, that have given the ultimate sacrifice. I would lift them to you and pray, Lord, for those families, Lord, those that, that are hurting, and as they continue to journey forward, I just pray for your strength and your guidance in their life. And dear God, this day, Lord, as we come to this place, I know there's ones here who may have heavy hearts, things on their their heart may be a physical issue, dear God. It may be a spiritual, emotional issue, Lord, they're dealing with. I just pray that you'll minister to that need. Give them comfort, peace. Give them strength that they need right now. May they feel your presence in a very real and powerful way, dear God. And just engulf them with that love that's so needed in their life right now. And Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before you this day. Lord, as you talk about our heart and how out of it flows life. So many times we try to guard it by, by hiding, Lord. We try to guard it by building a wall. May we be reminded that the strength that we have to grow is through confessing, Lord. Looking deep within our hearts, Lord, letting, allowing you through your Holy Spirit to search us, to find those things, Lord, that maybe jealousy, envy, strife, whatever is there, gets in the way of our walk. Convict us of those things, Heavenly Father, and may we release those to you and humble ourselves every day, Lord, that we can grow more fully in our walk with you. Lord, again, I thank you and praise you, Lord. And, Lord, as we leave this place this day, may we care in our heart the prayer that you taught so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I understand the concept of an unclouded day, and especially when it teaches us that it's that day beyond this world, beyond this earth, that we will have no more burdens, no more stress, we'll have safety, we'll have time to be in the arms of Jesus, literally. But here in this place, um, the unclouded days are few and far between. We look to those clouds as an opportunity to grow in the love of Jesus Christ. So as we're singing this song together, uh, realize the hope of an unclouded day, but the strength that you have to persevere through the cloud days as we stand together at the unclouded day. children come forward so we can smile upon them. You turn to one another and greet each other saying, I'm thankful for God who kicks me through the clouds. 
Well, there's no way to avoid it, and there's no way to skip through it. The camp meeting is developed for us to give glory to God. So glory be. In all that we have in Jesus, we give him the glory and the understanding, especially when there are those clouded days and especially in the clear days as well. God is with us. We realize that you are there watching and can't be here for whatever reason it is. We hope that you understand and feel the glory of God through this broadcast. And thank you for watching. Uh, let's go to the kids. Well, good morning, kids. Have you gone back to school? Yeah, are you enjoying it? No. What is it? Is it that you just have to get up so early in the morning? That's what I thought, yeah. And homework, yeah, I guess that is a problem. Well, let me bring up another nasty subject. Have you been to the doctor lately? Yes. You, yeah. How, how was that experience? Did you like it? No. No. Did you get a shot? No, you didn't get a shot? Well, what's wrong? I mean, doctors are good. They help us stay healthy and things like that. I'm, I'm sorry that you had a bad experience with a doctor because I think they do a good job helping us stay well. And sometimes they can look at us and go, I know exactly what's wrong with you. And they'll give you some medicine or they'll give you a shot. Now, sometimes they'll look at you and you'll say, well, this hurts and this hurts and this hurts. And the doctor will go, hmm, I'm not sure what's wrong with you. Maybe we should just operate. No, no that's not what a doctor says. No. What does operate mean? It means they cut you open. Yeah. <laughs> doctors, doctors will not say that. Because before, before they'll operate, they want to look deep inside of you. You know how they do that? No, they don't cut you open yet. <laughs> they give you an x-ray, just like this one. This is me. You can't see it? That's because an x-ray can only be seen when it's put up at a bright light. So can you see it now? Yeah, see? That's my neck. It, yeah, it's a real... Was that a short joke? <laughs> so the doctor took an x-ray to find out that, well, Mike, you don't need surgery after all. We can fix it with some other stuff, okay? Some medicine and some exercise, those kind of things, yeah. But I'm glad he took an x-ray instead of just cutting me right open, right? Yeah. So it's important, it's important to look inside before you start cutting things up that you don't know anything about, right? Well, the reason I told you all this story about my neck and the fact I didn't have to have surgery is to tell us, to, uh, to help us understand what Jesus said when he said, now when you look at someone else, don't judge them or condemn them because you really don't know what's going on inside them. They may mis be misbehaving because of something else going on in their life or in their family. So before you make a judgment, before you condemn someone, make sure you look close into their hearts. And the best way to do that is to put them up against the light of Christ. Just like the x-ray can, can only be seen in the bright light of, a, of uh, the sanctuary. Uh, yeah, I have a whole body here that you don't want to see. That's... You don't want to see the rest of that. So before you judge, put them up before the light of Christ. Know what's inside them. Let's pray together. Holy God in heaven, as your children, always help us to heal ourselves, especially when we do things wrong. And help us not to con condemn others before we know what's really going on inside them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's children get to say, Amen. Now, if you're going to Children's Church, Miss Lillian over here is going to take you upstairs, and that's where your parents will find them. Some of you are going to go back and sit with your families. I'm not sure which, but I think everybody pretty much is going to um, head off to, their, to the Children's Church. Now, as these kids are going this direction, I want to say something about our older kids, the youth. They are about to begin their seasonal Bible studies that start 
usually around, oh, very dark early. Uh, Roy is out there about 6 a.m. picking up kids, guiding them to different homes so they can have a Bible study. Over 100 kids uh, throughout Richmond County and Columbia County will be meeting in homes in their school districts before school starts. Some will meet in the afternoon after school. Just wanted to say thank you to the families that open up their home. If you're one of those families that open up your homes or are leading in the Bible study, I want you to stand and let us just say thank you. Uh, I know we've got the Kilpatricks upstairs. Come on, stand up. You don't, just because you sat up there doesn't mean you get, don't get to stand up. All right? Anybody else? Lisa Roberts helps lead the Bible studies, but she refuses to stand up. All right? I, is that right, Lisa? Lisa is the one that's looking down right there. Sure, right. Anyway, that begins this week. They'll also be tracking along with a Sermon on the Mount uh, with the sermons, and they'll be memorizing scripture that has to do with each one of these sections. So I'm very excited about that. On the front of your bulletin, you'll see, of course, the most uh, exciting thing happening this week is the consignment sale. I want you to notice that at the end, we, over the years, have raised almost three quarters of a million dollars to go directly to missions in our community, in the United States, and across the world. Quarter, three quarters of a million dollars. I think that's fabulous. What it doesn't show you is that each week we do this, we need about 400 volunteers, volun servants, or voluntolders, whatever it takes, right? <laughs> and so uh, if you've not yet signed up for your uh, time to work in the consignment sale, go online, check on that, and uh, we'll make sure we have a place for you to serve with directions on what to do when you get there. My job is the holding tank. It's the simplest job in the whole week. You cannot have my job. <laughs> That's mine. And I hope you find your place to serve. Ushers, if you'll come forward, let us continue to worship God as we offer him our gifts and tithes. Let's pray together. Merciful and holy God, we do thank you today for all the good things that come in our lives. Forgive us when we don't stop to count our blessings. Forgive us because we have been truly, deeply blessed. And now during this time of offering, use our gifts. And may they be generous gifts, imitating your generosity. Use these gifts and our lives to the advancement of the kingdom of Jesus Christ in our neighborhood and in our world. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
Wonderful, Joel, and thank you, choir. Beautiful music. Hope that you'll consider being a part of that singing ministry. We turn now to the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to the seventh chapter. Remember, I've told you the Sermon on the Mount is chapters 5, 6, and 7. So we're going to jump to the seventh chapter after we've had that high standard of behavior lifted before us and see how Jesus is transitioning toward the end. Uh, remember, I've also challenged you to read through every Saturday or Sunday morning all three chapters. I'd, I'd like to say raise your hand if you've done that, but I'm, I'm a little scared to do so. But next week, I'm going to ask you, all right? So make sure you do it. Also, if you want to go a little bit deeper, on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we have a Bible study on the Sermon on the Mount I'll be leading. Uh, we're going to start off in the classroom over behind the chapel. Uh, then we're going to move up to the, the youth building. But, uh, so if you want to start this Wednesday night with me, be sure you follow me. We also have two Sunday school classes doing the same uh, lesson at 945. And that would be um, uh, Cornerstone and Real People, uh, Greg and... Hatfield's class, and then we've got uh, Richard Krim's class there. All right, let us stand as we honor the reading of God's holy word from Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Let us trust the Holy Spirit to awaken our curiosity, to inspire our understanding, and even to change the way we behave in the reading of God's holy word. You may be seated. Have you ever been accused by someone who said, You holier-than-thou hypocrite! How dare you judge me? Doesn't your own Jesus say, judge not? Show of hands. How many of you have actually said that to someone else, huh? Might have gotten it a little bit wrong, though. It seems that the world knows this scripture very well, at least the first phrase. Judge not. A writer at the turn of the millennium, 18 years ago, diagnosed middle-class America as having an almost pathological fear of appearing judgmental to other people. He says it's almost like they've done away with the Ten Commandments and they've shortened it to one commandment, thou shalt not judge. <laughs> so the only true way to be ostracized in our culture today is to be closed-minded. The intolerant are the ones that cannot be tolerated. But what if we got rid of the principle of judgment? What would happen in our courtrooms? A judge who wouldn't judge? A jury who have seen the facts but yet can't quite say guilty to those who have been caught? What would happen with the prophetic role of the church when it is spoken against evil in our own culture and society? What, how would we have ended slavery, outlawed child labor, emancipated women, ushered in the civil rights movement? How in the world can we judge a wrong when we've gutted the principle of judgment altogether? How? Especially when culture uses this very verse, verse 1, against us. Well, let's examine that a little bit more closely. I hope you've opened your Bibles to chapter 7 so you can see how Jesus sets this up as we go along. Of course, the first verse is a command as and a warning. It comes together. A command and a warning. It's a command because we're the followers of Jesus. He can command us to do things, and we're supposed to obey. It becomes a warning because we're still under probation. We're still sinning. We're still needing forgiveness. 
And yes, we need to know how it's done. We are warned, judge not that you be not judged. As I was telling the children, so often when we judge someone, we condemn them. We don't really know what's behind their behavior. Behind that behavior might be some hidden motives that we completely do not understand. And behind those motives might be some tangled history with other people and other situations in their lives. We're just not privy to the way their life has unfolded. Only God knows that, and he's not added that to our job description to be godlike in the sense of knowing what's going on in other people's lives. One particular preacher said that having a, a severely critical spirit of others, a spirit of condemnation, is not a gift from the Holy Spirit. In fact, it's a gift from hell itself. A judgmental spirit is like acid on the gospel of love that we try to preach and practice. Having a critical condemning spirit is the mother of gossip, and its offsprings are the fractured lives and relationships that we have because we've pointed the finger and we've spoken the harsh words. And we can judge other people without even saying it, can't we? <laughs> Just because you're silent and say, oh, I've never been critical verbally, doesn't mean we're off the hook because we can do it with our look, can't we? I remember my mother judging me with just a look. Boy, I melted. I've had other people do it to me as well. And so when we come to this commandment to judge not, we need to understand that it's not just a casual observation, a, a critique of some nature. It's condemning is what it means. And to know this is very simple. You turn to the Gospel of Luke where Jesus is teaching the same part on the Sermon on the Plain, and there he says, judge not lest you be judged, condemn not lest you be condemned. Jesus spells it out there. He's talking about condemning another person. I learned a new word this week when they were talking about what judge means in the Greek. It's a simple word, krino in Greek, but it has like 12 different uh, meanings that can go along with it. We know this means condemning, or as one scholar said, a censorious fashion. I never knew what that meant. It means severe. So I'm wondering, why couldn't he just said severe? When we are severely critical of someone else, to the point in which we condemn them wholly because of an action we have seen them take. I think that's an important lesson for us, never to condemn the whole because of a part. Never condemn the whole because of a part. Now, the image that Jesus is using here is quite uh, vivid. Uh, in fact, I wanted to put a, an image on the front of the bulletin of uh, somebody's eyeball with a log in it. I found it. It was gross. <laughs> uh, it made the point by, by far, but I just couldn't quite bring myself to putting that on front of our bulletin. And so the image that Jesus is pulling together here is cartoonish and grotesque at the same time, uh, but it's an image he would be very familiar with because he's a carpenter, right? As a carpenter, you're working with wood. Do you not think that sometime during his career, he got a speck of sawdust in his eye, maybe even a splinter? And didn't he know that that splinter, that piece of sawdust came from a bigger piece, a plank or a log? So he's developing this image because of his experience of being a carpenter. He knows what he's doing when he uses this image of not condemning the whole because of a splinter, a speck of dust, a part of someone's life. As I was studying through it, I was reminded of our new uh, fangled social media craze that's going on in our world today. It seems that uh, social media allows us to condemn a person outright because of one thing that he or she has written. Because in social media, you can't see the other person. I mean, they could live a world away. They, they could be in a, in, in a whole other situation. You have no idea what their heart and their life is really like. But yet, in the comment section, where the devil is, <laughs> we can just outright condemn someone because of something they've said. Makes me wonder if we had that same person saying that in front of us, say, over a Coca-Cola or a cup of coffee. Would we say it the same way? Probably not. Probably we would have a little bit more finesse with how we're going to have a conversation with that person. I think it's important that we see a person face to face before we condemn the whole 
because of the part. Now, this is the same thing that Jesus was confronted with when a, a group of Pharisees, a group of men, brought before him a woman who had been caught in adultery. She was guilty. And the law provided that she would be stoned to death because of that one act. The Pharisees brought her to Jesus, trying to trick him into making that statement so they could discredit him in front of other people. And so the world always knows this story up to a certain point, and usually that point is where Jesus says, let the one who has no sin throw the first stone. And so the world looks at us Christians and says, look, when you are without sin, then you can judge me. You can throw that first stone. But you see, that story has more to it. There's a backside to it. Because after Jesus says that, the Pharisees go, oh yeah, we do have sin. They drop their stones and they leave one at a time. Jesus then looks at the woman and says, where are the ones that condemn you? Where are the ones that were going to put you to death because of this sin? She says, they're gone. And Jesus says, well, I'm, I'm not going to condemn you either. But go and sin no more. He confronts the sin, but will not condemn the whole because of the one sin. Never condemn the whole because of the part. Also in this first verse, we've got to be aware that there's a boomerang effect. You know what a boomerang is? It's one of those Australian things you throw out and what? It comes right back to you. If you're not ready for it, <laughs> it could knock your head off. In this boomerang effect, most people look at this scripture and they're saying, okay, do not judge others or they might judge you. Does that sound right? Don't judge others because then they will judge you. That's not right. It's not the way it's meant. The passive voice in this Greek sentence indicates that it's not the others that you're judging that will judge you, but it's implied that it's God who will judge you. The boomerang effect comes from God. <laughs> what goes around comes around. Have you had heard that one lately? What goes around comes around. Now, I'm not saying this is a, a verse of karma or anything, but it's, it's God trying to get your attention that if you throw out a judgment, it's going to come back to you from God. Heard a cute little story about this measure that you give is the measure you'll, it'll be taken to you about a doctor who was talking to a good friend at a party. His friend happened to be a lawyer. And they were in a, 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 a great conversation about their professions when a lady comes up to the doctor and interrupts and says, Doctor, I have this problem with my leg. She goes into a great length about what was wrong. He looks at her, gives her some advice, and says, make sure you see me this week or you know, see someone next week because you're going to need some more attention to that. And she leaves. The doctor turns to his friend, the lawyer, and he's disgusted that this, this lady just interrupted him. And, and he asked his lawyer friend, and he said, now, can I legally bill this lady for this advice? And he said, certainly you can do that. So the next morning when he got to his office, he had his secretary bill this lady. It was stuck in the mail. That afternoon when the mail came in, he got a letter from his lawyer. It was a bill. <laughs> that one had to come around, didn't it? The measure that you use will be the measure that you get. Now, I'm going to quote a lot of scripture in the next part of the sermon. I was just kind of amazed this week that there is so much more scripture that talks about judgment and it helps us illuminate this particular uh, five verses. And so I've listed those in the sermon notes that you can get online on your app. Uh, on, not on the website, but a, an app called YouVersion. Some of you are using that. Uh, if you want to find those scriptures, then uh, I've listed them uh, on that. But I was amazed at how much uh, f uh, fleshing out this idea of judge not lest you be judged happens not only with Jesus, but also with the Apostle Paul. And you're going to hear a lot from the Apostle Paul about judgment. Why? Well, the same reason we heard a lot about it last week, about love your enemies. Because Paul considered himself the chief sinner of being judgmental. I mean, his whole career before he was saved was judging other people. And when the Christian movement started up, he went, oh boy, a whole another group of people to condemn and even to arrest, literally, in their lives. So Paul understood what it meant to be judgmental. So in Romans chapter 2, 
verses 1 through 6. I'm going to read all six verses, so follow along with me. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment are doing the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human, not God, a mere human, pass judgment on them, and yet you're doing the same thing, do you think you're going to escape God's judgment? No, you're showing contempt for God's riches, His kindness, His forbearance, His patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. But because of your stubbornness, because of your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. I don't think I could explain Matthew chapter 7, 1 through 5, any better than what Paul has just done there. He would go on to tell the church at Corinth, my conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. It's the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before it's appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. And that, at that time, each person will receive their praise from God. The implication is, at that time, each will receive not only their praise from God, but will also receive their judgment from God. All people go before the judgment seat of Christ, including those who are saved by the grace of Christ. There are some things in our lives that still need to be judged and done away with. And so, at the end of verses 1 through 5, Jesus kind of gives us a little formula. I know it's a formula because he says first, and then he says then. First, then. That's a formula in my book, right? So let's go through that. First, take the log out of your own eye. That's called self-examination. Leo Tolstoy would write, everybody thinks that changing the world is the thing to do, but nobody ever begins by changing themselves. And that's what happens with us. The Apostle Paul pointed that out about our way of staying away from self-examination. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if we were more discerning with regards to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we're being disciplined so we won't be condemned at the end. In 2 Corinthians, he says, examine yourselves. See whether you are in the faith or not. Test yourselves. In Galatians, if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to others, which is where the judging spirit comes in. I love the beginning of the Methodist movement when John Wesley was first starting out preaching and he was gathering crowds. Uh, Whitfield was gathering more crowds, but he forgot to organize his folks. John Wesley got a big crowd together and then he would assign you to a small group. He didn't say, uh, we need some folks to volunteer to go to this group. We need some folks to volunteer for this. No, he just looked at you and said, okay, I'm going to have this group. Y'all go over and meet this way. Y'all go over and meet this way. And if you don't meet... You don't get to take communion next week. I mean, he was serious about this. Anyway, he would put them in these groups together for self-examination, mutual self-examination, mutual correction, which I'll talk about in a second. He would ask them to watch over one another in love, help one another along the path of salvation, the royal path of salvation is what he would call it. He put us together so we could help one another. And then he would list some questions that you had to ask each other. First one is beautiful. How is it with your soul? What a great way to start a, a Sunday school class or, or a small Bible study. Just begin by saying, how is it with your soul this week? Not, you know, how's your body feel or how is your thinking, but how's your soul? 
Then the next question, most of us would be bailing out. What known sins have you committed since our last meeting? <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> what known sins have you committed since our last meeting? Uh, we've been trying to recover this discipline of mutual correction and mutual self-examination in our modern culture. Um, the Sunday school classes used to be that, but now we've just got, we, we, we treat our Sunday school classes, this is class, this is, this is an educational unit. We, we, we don't have enough time to stop and ask the question, how is it with your soul? What sins have you committed that need to be aired out? See, because we have to get, you have to get real close to each other to do something like that. Judge not, but when you're close, this close together, you can judge one another. Jesus condemns selfish judgment, but he condones self-judgment. The Lord knows that self-examination will eliminate that self-centered condemnation of others. So first, Jesus says, work on getting the log out of your own eye. Now, I got to thinking about that log. You know, you see these cartoons, a big old plank sticking out of your eyeball. It's grotesque. But I got to thinking, you know, if you've got a splinter in your own eye, it feels like a log, doesn't it? The splinter in your eye doesn't bother me near as much as the splinter in my own eye. Maybe that's why it feels like it's a log in my own eye, which is the second part of verse 5. First, take the log out of your own eye. Then, then you can see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. I call this mutual correction kind of based off Ephesians 5, where Paul talks about how a husband and wife should love each other. He begins that whole section by saying that we should be mutually submissive to one another. It's not who's in charge, it's we're submitting to each other. And so in the Christian world, we are mutually correcting one another, trying to help each other with the splinters that we have in our eyes. When I was in college, I had a job for three summers with my uncle who owned a welding uh, company. And I got to explore all the kind of uh, wonderful things about welding and grinding and, and knew then that I didn't want to make a whole career out of it. But one day, I got a metal splinter in my eye. I didn't know it was there. I went through the whole day not being bothered at all by it. Every once in a while, I, I felt a little prick, but that was about it. But that night when I went to bed, the eyeball, which cannot feel, the eyelid came down and it could feel and it was screaming all night get this thing out of my eye so the next day I went to the doctor and he took a little magnet and it was gone it was very easy but when we have a splinter in our eye whether it's physical or if it's sinful we are not whole we need some help getting that splinter out of our eye we need to find someone who perhaps has gone through the same situation who can help us remove our splinter from our eye. So you see, it's not wrong to confront a person about his or her sin. In fact, it's wrong if you don't, if you're your brother and sister in Christ. In the Old Testament, Leviticus 19 says, do not hate your brother in your heart, but rather correct them, rebuke them, so that they will not be abused by their sin. If you love your brother or sister, confront them. Let them know that something's wrong with them. It's killing them. It's, they're suffering consequences because of it. To be tolerant doesn't mean to be morally indifferent. We're called upon to judge each other in a sense, if long as we have first gone through our own self-examination. But even if we've gone through self-examination, <laughs> judging others can still be done with the wrong spirit, can it not? You see, the spirit of judgment must be done so that we're trying to help and correct constructively a brother or sister, not to condemn them, not to severely condemn them. I, I love the words that Paul uses in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, those of you who live in the Spirit should restore that person gently. What a word. Now, sometimes we forget the word gently, and we just correct them abusively. We are to do it gently. 
even Jesus said it was okay to judge as long as we do it correctly. In John chapter 7, he was facing some Pharisees who basically uh, judged people by their outward appearance. You know, if you could look snazzy, you were holy. But Jesus said to them, stop judging by mere appearances. Instead, judge correctly. Judge correctly. Do it right. In Matthew chapter 18, he tells the, the fellowship of the disciples together. He says, if one of you disciples sins, then a brother or a sister should go and point out your fault. And just between the two of you, talk it out. And if your brother listens, you've won him over. If he will not listen, then take one or two more people who care and are concerned about him. And then he goes on and says, if not, well, then you go before the church. Then you go before the church. Mutual correction is what Jesus is trying to steer us in this passage from Matthew chapter 7. I mean, this is after he's already told us that we've got to live up to a very high standard of behavior and living. Oh, we can never quite reach everything. And so we think that he's, when he says judge not, then we, oh, we just can't be judgmental at all. But there is a right spirit in which to do it. Now, you might say to yourself, well, I've never judged anyone. And you might be right. But that doesn't make you a good Christian. You're not saved because you haven't judged anyone. You're saved because you've judged yourself against the high standards of what Christ has put before you. And you have found yourself lacking. You have found yourself a sinner, self-condemned, heartily sorrowful and repentive, but still acquitted by the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. And so now, as one who is healed, you can help another sinner find their way out of their sin. You can see clearly to help them remove the splinter from their eye. A good friend of mine in seminary, he was a little older than I am, so he's already retired. He can write whatever he wants to these days. But I love what he said about this particular passage. Until we see people through the merciful eyes of God the Father, until the, re the risen Jesus shows us worth and beauty amidst the crud and the compromise of our brother and sister, until the Holy Spirit corrects our own sight with divine revelation, then we'll never understand this scripture at its depth. Because out of our ignorance, we act with arrogance, with criticism, and judgment. This is what Christ forbids. This is what Christ forbids. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we come to before you today with splinters and logs in our eyes. For some of us, we've had this ailment for a long, long time. We've kind of grown comfortable with our logs sticking in our eye. And as cartoonish as that sounds like, it's the truth. So today, Lord, we come before you realizing that in the Sermon on the Mount, you had some high expectations of us. And the log in our eye shows that we've ignored those. We've been happy to, to bounce along at the bottom. Oh, Lord, help us to find a friend who's already found a way to remove the plank from their eyes to help us with our splinter. May there be a brother and sister who loves us enough to speak the truth in love and to help us. Oh, Lord, help us to examine ourselves so that we can be helpful to others who have not yet been concerned enough about the splinter in their own eyes. In this way, we become your body, the body of Christ, concerned about the eyes. Praying all of this in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. This has been the worship service from Trinity on the Hill United Methodist Church a production of Trinity Methodist Television as an outreach ministry to those of the Augusta area. If you found this to be a meaningful service, let us hear from you by calling 738-8822
or writing Trinity on the Hill, 1330 Montesano Avenue, Augusta, Georgia, 30904.